Once Upon a Time in Lodi, Alabama by Marcus Carter There'll be nigs down there, sings Lamont while plucking a tune on his banjo. Papa Day doesn't respond. From his porch, he just looks out at his vast farmland with a content smile. It was another warm summer evening on the outskirts of Lodi, Alabama. The sun could be seen receding deeper into the sky, leaving the small town with a dull orange glow. As usual, it wouldn't be long before the town turned dark, forcing the moon and stars to glint across the sky. An evening like this usually came with much hope for the laborers. They would have the next day all to themselves, leaving behind their old masters to eagerly await the dawning of Monday. If most farm owners could have their way, there would be no Sunday rest. Sunday for them would be another work day, but not for old Papa Day. Papa Day was a colored man who took pride in listening to his friends and neighbors who came around occasionally, narrate their Sunday evening escapades to him as they went about helping out on his 12 acres farmland. Papa Day adjusted himself on his old chair, which was so old that his good friend Lamont often joked about it being as old as his house. He looked at his large farmland from his porch and smiled. He was proud of how much he was able to achieve within the past 20 years. Lamont and he sat for hours, looking at the beauty of the land. The land extended across the perimeter of Papa Day's house. A greater part of the soil was loamy, quite good enough to support the rapid growth of his plantain plantation. Roots of different fruit trees sunk deep into the ever-fertile soil of the second part of the land. Large grassland extended to the left towards the sturdy wooden fence and was home to a herd of cattle. The two old friends were both pleased with Papa Day's achievement and felt blessed for the freedom they now enjoyed, freedom that had eluded them for over 50 years of their lives. They both felt that age and land gave them certain freedom. Age and land will give you that freedom, Papa Day said. Lamont nodded and agreed to what he just said, despite having heard those words severally during the last twenty years. Papa Day continued, Land the freedom to do what the hell you please, and old age to not give a damn what people think. Lamont couldn't agree more. He was witness to the fact that Papa Day had enjoyed good twenty years of contentment on his majestic farm. Because of the horrors of slavery, most of his friends and relatives never got the chance to breathe the air of the freedom, so he rested on the porch for them. Papa Day was hard, sometimes mean, but always fair. For the most part, he treated people pretty good, but there were a few he wished he treated much better. His first wife was one of them. He looked down in Mahogany, his mixed-bred German shepherd mutt dog, whom he fondly called Mo. He had named her after his ex-wife, Mahogany, that left him long ago. That's a genuine German Shepherd pure breed. He'd say proudly to anybody that would listen. But today he was thinking of his huge colored ex-wife, Mahogany, not the dog. Papa Day looked down at Mo, his eyes emitting a threatening stare to his beloved companion. I should kick you for eating my turkey dinner leaving me with just the big leg. His anger was not particularly directed at the brown hairy dog who threw a puzzled look at him the moment he let out his accusation. It was directed at his ex-wife, whom he was still mad at for leaving him at the end of slavery in search of a better life. Papa Day didn't have much luck with the women in his life. His first two wives had left him, forcing him to live only on the memories of what he once shared with them. After his first wife, Mahogany, left, he tried finding love again with one other woman, but just like with Mahogany, his affair with her was short-lived. It seemed as if Papa Day was destined to be forlorn. Mo looked up at him with a look of innocence, one that was capable of convicting him of his error of transferred aggression. There be eggs down there. Lamont repeated, this time more firmly than he did the first time, shaking his head. Ignoring Lamont's statement, 
Papade stopped and turned to look up at the hill. Despite his six foot two inches height that was often an advantage to him, he didn't see a thing, but he did hear a break in the dusk. He heard the wind calling, tumbleweeds crackling. He gently caressed his V-shaped face down to his black mustache with his left fingers, gently letting them fall on the rope of his brown hat that he had skillfully strapped around his neck. His dark brown eyes and black skin, which were quite similar to that of Lamont, shone as the evening light reflected on them. Let me get a swig of that Jake Snake whiskey, Papa Day said, grumbling because Lamont was sitting in his rocking chair. And hand me Lucille. Lamont handed him his shotgun that he named after Lucille, his childhood sweetheart. Lucille was a big boned woman with pretty black skin, which was smooth as silk. The prettiest girl in Mooresville County, he would say. Oh, how he loved Lucille. Lucille had run off with his half-cousin, Raymond, soon after he stole two Morgan horse without leaving him a goodbye note or one of her fine chicken dinners. Papa Day looked at his shotgun, Lucille, holding it tight. Oh, Lucille, be good tonight, he said as he looked through its eye hole. Two, no. Three men coming, Papa Day said to Lamont. Papa Day's father raised many chickens and had that chicken sense. Papa Day had it too. He could tell trouble coming a mile away. A minute later, a little Negro boy came running into Papa Day's farm, busting open the gate. Mo started barking ferociously, but then stopped when he noticed it was just a small boy. Lamont jumped up. Oh, Papa Day. You stupid wrong this time, you old gray goat. It's just a youngin' coming. No trouble, no trouble at all. Lamont, the more jovial one among them, who always wore a smile at all times, was proud he finally proved Papa Day wrong. Lamont looked at Papa Day, who was two inches taller than him, with a smile and adjusted his hat, which was a bit smaller than Papa Day's hat. Papa Day understood the reason behind the smile. Lamont was happy to have proven him wrong. The young kid ran in, gasping for breath. The clan is coming! The clan is coming! What? What? Papa Day asked. The clan is coming! The boy repeated. Papa Day yelled back at the boy. Say, you one of the Ray's grandkids? He paused to catch a breath. Then he continued. Bobby Ray? No, I'm Billy Ray, the boy replied. Bobby Ray's my older brother. It was evident from the way the young boy was still gasping for breath that he had run for a very long time. Papa Day spoke abruptly. Tell that grandpa of yours to return that cutting saw he borrowed from me. He paused to count his fingers. Five, no, six summers ago. Uh, My grandpa said you ain't getting no saw until you give him the two roosters you owe him, Billy Ray replied. One, one damn rooster. Papa Day replied defensively. Suddenly, he remembered the message the young boy just passed across, and the reality of the message began to dawn on him. You said the clan is coming? They're right behind me, about a half mile. They stopped off at Mary Bell's place to buy one of Aunt May's peach cobblers. He paused briefly to catch a breath, and then he continued. My grandpa told me to run here as fast as I can. Lamont cast a troubled look at Papa Day, who appeared unperturbed about the information the lad just passed to him. How many? Papa Day asked. Three, the Ray boy replied. Papa Day turned to Lamont with a half smile, more concerned about being correct about the number of people he heard and sensed than the fear of the KKK coming. Three saddle-bred horses raced into the farm as if on a mission to get their riders some gold ribbon in a keenly contested game. Three hooded men came over the hill and suddenly came to a halt in front of Papa Day's house. One of the clansmen, the tallest of the men who happened to be their leader, yelled at the boy to go back home. Papa Day and Lamont both took a large swig of the Jake Snake whiskey but didn't move at all. Somehow, Papa Day seemed to have infected Lamont with his fearlessness. Papa Day and Lamont both gave each other a familiar stare. Papa Day whispered into Lamont's ear, Harvester time. A smile played at the corner of their lips. 
Their confidence irritated the leader of the clansmen, but not as much as the presence of the boy did. Turning to the boy, who was keen on seeing the entire events unfold before his eyes, he repeated his order. You heard me, little Ray nigger boy. I said get the getting out of here. Then Billy Ray ran back in the same direction that he had run in from. As soon as he got to the gate, he turned to look at the five older men to have a last look at what would happen. Suddenly, his desire to see everything to the end overwhelmed him, and he quickly changed his mind. He ran towards the left side of the farm and hid behind a large oak tree. From his new position, he watched on. The leader of the clansmen, a white middle-aged man with goatee beards, looked at Papa Day with the same disdain he had been doing for the past 20 years ever since the colored people got their emancipation from their slave masters. He pushed the smoke from his cigar in Papa Day's direction, threw the spent stick down and smashed the lid end of it with his black boot. He pushed back his hood to reveal his long brown curly hair, which he had packed backwards. His brown eyes narrowed within their sockets as he spoke. Crazy old man, the leader began dramatically. Don't give me no shit. We pretty much left you alone out here on your farm. We haven't bothered you for years. Why are you still here? Your wife Mahogany gone? Kids gone up north? You still here in the middle of nowhere. All these years, you could have sold the land, gone up north yourself. What's keeping a crazy old man in Lodi, Alabama? He asked, half laughing. You niggas love living in this little piece of shit town. Papa Day, who didn't find his insults amusing, couldn't understand why he was laughing. Oh, you crackers always say somebody crazy just because they stand up to you and your man. The leader ignored his comment and went straight to his reason for coming to his farm. We heard you hiding three runaway niggas. As soon as he said that, the other two clansmen started walking around the house in search of the said Negroes. And one, that little Bo Baker, touched a white woman behind. What's her name again? He asked no one in particular. Sally Woods. Papa Day whispered to Lamont. He sure did. That girl been sweet on that man for months. Little Bo probably gave in because none of the colored women would date his bad luck ass anymore. He lowered his voice the more he spoke. Burned down half the church, killed Uncle Charles' favorite cow. Man, this porch still ain't right since he messed it up. It's been leaning like Aunt May's cakes ever since. Lamont chirped in, looking down at the crooked porch. Papa Day continued his short narrative. And what's her name? That old sweet lady living by the... Flicker Pond still ain't walking right, selling that bad moonshine, and now she got that shaky Jake leg. Papa Day finally spoke aloud. Bo not a bad kid, just shit always happens around him and clumsy as hell. The Klansman wasn't interested in his tale, and he didn't hesitate to bear his mind before the two old friends. If you hadn't them run away on your property, he said, we'll find them. Papa Day's temper rose. Cracker, he yelled. Slaver has been over for damn near 20 years, but never a sharecropper that leaves your farm owing you money. You still call them damn runaways. Lamont nodded in agreement to what Papa Day just said. Listen to what I'm saying. The three coloreds that stay in here, Spit, they ain't from around here, and they damn sure ain't the ones that owe you any sharecropping money. The Klansmen looked at him in disbelief. Hell... You all never paid the colored people fairly anyway, Papa Day quickly added. The leader of the clansmen took three steps nearer to the old men. Papa Day sensed trouble and quickly raised his rifle a little more. Stop your sassin', the clansmen said. Well, there's three of us this time. I don't give a shit, Papa Day retorted. I'm 73 years old. Damn, is it 75 or 76, Lamont? Lamont was silent. Papa Day continued. Damn clan. Whom the hell do you think you are? Hiding in secret. Fred Thornton. Everybody knows you stole some of my land. Scared my second wife Betty away. He suddenly stopped at the mention of Betty to reflect on her unique characteristics. He began to talk about those attributes in a half-dreamy state. That brown-eyed girl. Fine and strong, too. 
Can pick up two goats if she had to when they escaped from the pen. I sure do miss my babe, Betty. By this time, the other two clansmen were searching around the house for the three escapees. Listen, I'm only going to tell your ass one time, Fred Thornton, the leader of the clansmen, said. You may not give a shit about your sorry black self or, hell, maybe even P.I. Lamont. Lamont looked his way as soon as he heard his name. Now, I know you don't want nothing to happen to that little Ray nigger boy out there. I see his ass hiding behind the tree. He can't run faster than this bullet here. And everybody knows how much you love your dog, Mo. Mo was watching the other two clansmen, but then turned his head and looked at the one talking when she heard her name mentioned. Come on now, put the rifle down. You ain't gonna get all of us before we get the boy and the dog. We know about your lazy brown eye can't shoot like he used to, the clansman said, hoping that his threats were powerful enough to scare Papa Day. Papa Day lowered his shotgun as Fred pushes past Papa Day and walk inside the house. The clansman started walking around inside the house. Papa Day looked down at his dog, then outside the window at the boy still crouching by the tree. Lamont, tell him, Papa Day said. Lamont, tell him. Tell him these crackers where you know. Well, Lamont began, you know, Red was shouting his mouth off again at Willie Barr. Must have overheard me and little Bo talking last week about the visitors. You know, he said to Papa Day in a whisper, he was talking about the nigs. He paused to observe Papa Day's facial expression. But, uh, he said nigs, not niggers. Papa Day gave Lamont one of those death stares he usually had when he was getting ready to put down a sick cow. Lamont continued despite Papa Day's mood. So, Mr. Red must have thought I was talking about the three colors you referred to. Lamont concluded his explanation. One of the clansmen's voices echoed from the basement, distracting the three men from their conversation. I hear something in the basement, he said. Fred Thornton threw a fierce look at Papa Day, who quickly felt the need to speak in self-defense. Well, yeah, I'm keeping somebody, but not the people, not the colors you looking for. They mean nobody no harm, they just trying to get home. Unfortunately, his explanation wasn't convincing enough. Fred hurried towards the basement. We ain't from around here, Papa Day shouted as they stormed down the stairs to the basement. The other clansmen shouted again from the basement while running down the stairs. We got a tree for your thieving ass. It's time for a picnic. Pick a nigger. God damn it. The clansmen cried out after a short while. Lamont ran to the door, leading to the basement stairs, and stood at the top of the stairs to cry out. Mag face! Protect! Protect! He screamed. God damn it! Fred Thornton cried out. God, God damn, damn it. it! Lamont and Papa Day cried out too, in unison. Three large, ten-foot-high, metallic black, faceless androids grabbed two of the clansmen. The Nig's <laughs> androids shot a mission phonic light beam out of his hand, instantly disintegrating. Fred Thornton took two steps backwards and quickly turned around to run, but was grabbed by the other android. His neck was quickly crushed in the process. The android shot out another beam of light, disintegrating his body in the process. The two black metallic soldiers went back into sentry mode and stood at attention. Two flashes. All three clansmen disappeared. The two friends cried out in horror. They shivered at the sight of the heap of red paste that the three clansmen had been reduced to. Nothing was left of the clan, not even their clothes. The only evidence of their existence was the red fluid that spilled across the floor. The rest of their bodies were a mass of thick red paste. Lamont turned around and puked out the alcoholic beverage he had drank earlier that evening. Papa Day just stared down at the sight before him. When he first set his eyes on the nigs, he knew that they could be dangerous. He didn't know how dangerous they could be. Upon hearing the noise upstairs, the pantry door swung open and little Bo came out of hiding with his girlfriend, Sally Woods, in his hand and a plate of what was left of some of Papa Day's turkey they had for dinner in the other hand. The two in hand slowly walked down the stair to view the horrendous spectacle. See? See, I told you, Sally. Metal black men be here in the basement. Papa Day got himself some live metal men, little Bo told Sally in excitement. 
Little Bo was a skinny, 5'4", 22-year-old Negro boy that could easily pass for an 18-year-old. Sally was a fair-skinned, sand-blonde-haired Creole woman whom her mother forced her to pass for white. Sally's leg stiffened beneath her weight and wouldn't let her move an inch from where she stood transfixed. She stared on at the black faceless soldiers with her mouth wide open and for the first few minutes couldn't say a word. She couldn't even make out the meaning of the huge objects that stood in front of her. Finally, she found her voice. What the hell are those? she asked. Goddamn bad luck, little Bo gonna get us all killed, Papa Day said. Fred Thornton must attract you two here. Not taking Papa Day's words to heart, little Bo looked at the soldier and back at her in excitement. These be Papa Day's Negroes, he replied. Nigs, Pa Day, who had gotten over the gory sight, shouted. Nigs, Sally asked. What's Nigs? N-I-G-S. Neutron International Government Soldiers, Papa Day replied, proud he was able to pronounce the words. They can fight wicked men like the Klansmen, and they work on Papa Day's farm, too. I don't know what you all are talking about or what's going on in here, but I'm getting up out of here, as she ran up the stairs. Hold on, little Creole girl, shouted Papa Day. Wait a minute, shouted little Bo. Everybody following Sally as she ran up the stairs. Papa Day and everybody all running after her. Little Bo stopped her at the front door. Wait, hold a bit. Tell them, Lamont said. Spill it, Papa Day. Hell, we're all in this mud hole together. He paused briefly to catch a breath before speaking further. But give them a little bit of the Jake Snake whiskey first. But just a snip, Lamont opined. Well, she ain't gonna believe it anyway, and after that Jake Snake whiskey, she may not even remember it. <laughs> <laughs> well, about a month ago, I saw a bright blue flash out there by the big oak trees. Papa Day began his narrative. Sally and Little Bo, who were both unaware of how Niggs came to be on Papa Day's farm, listened with rapt attention. Papa Day continued. It was followed by a white line of light, and then I saw three large shadowy figures behind the oak trees over there, he said, pointing at the oak trees. Little Bo and Sally looked in the direction of his pointed finger. They were near the fence, right next to Travis' tree. Sally gave him an encouraging nod. He continued, At first, well, I thought it was those big Baxter boys stealing fruit from my Laquat tree. Boy... He said and shook his head in amazement. Those kids can eat. Lamont, who had once seen them eating, nodded in agreement. Papa Day continued his narrative, his voice breaking off gradually as a result of his advancing age. As I got closer, I realized it wasn't the Baxter boys. It's something more ominous, but... Then I wasn't afraid. No, not at all. He paused to look at the faces of the young people he was narrating his experience to. They appeared to be listening keenly. It was some crazy horse shit. I was never been much of a church-going person, but as I looked up, I was reciting scripture like St. Matthew himself, and complete... The task that has been given to me, and then I wasn't afraid anymore, I said with conviction. He paused again and continued almost immediately. That's Matthew or something. Can't remember which one. Is that a scripture at all? Sally asked, and the young people burst into laughter at Papa Day's attempt to quote the scriptures. <laughs> <laughs> Papa Day understood why they did that and didn't take it to heart. He continued with his story, notwithstanding their ridicule. I looked, and the shadow faded away, and three massive, faceless, all black metal men were standing in front of me, ten feet tall, polished metallic parts shown always. Did you try talking to them? Sally asked. Yes, Papa Day replied, excited that she was finding his narrative interesting. I asked him if they were alive. 
Their bodies remained still, but one head moved slightly toward me while his body remained at salute stands. Suddenly, a ray of light filled the emptiness of this black faceless machine. Then millions of stars filled his round face and glowed. Suddenly, a bright blue ray shone on my face. Images, most of them, I can't describe or understand, but somehow, Niggs made me understand. One of the images was a beautiful colored woman of some significance. She had long golden crimped hair, her eyes luminously blinding like summertime sun. She was fitted in all white and walked with both conviction and desperation. Her hand was extended out. Her mouth didn't move, but I heard her talking to me, saying, You may not understand everything you see or hear. That's okay. The important thing to know is that the Nigs are soldiers from the future. We sent them to help you so you can save us. As soon as she said that, the, the Nigs' faces <clears throat> turned black and faceless again. Well, they stood <clears throat> still, <clears throat> still and quiet. <clears throat> his words got choked in his cough. When his respiratory tract felt relaxed enough, he went back to completing the story that had so much captured the attention of little Bo and Sally. She continued to explain that the Nigs travel from 500 years in the future. He paused to coordinate his words carefully. Sally, who was eager to hear the full story, gestured to him to keep speaking. Huh, 500 years in the future, the Nigs were ordered to, well, in their time they will call it programmed, not ordered. Like what we get in a church service, a church program? Little Bo asked, beginning to feel the effects of the whiskey. No, it is when you are fetched to do something, like stop a killing. Yeah, the Nigs was supposed to stop the killing of a president. Abraham Lincoln? Little Bo asked. Too late for that, he did. He died in the theater in his Sunday's best clothes. <laughs> Snickering. Don't think so. Papa Day replied thoughtfully. He was younger and no beard. He paused to recall some more details and, when he couldn't, voiced out his frustration. Oh, shit. Can't remember. Damn it. It was important, too. I need to write this shit down. Maybe save it in some of them empty whiskey bottles. Mr. Kennedy was his name, I think. Yeah, John. Mm, uh, John Boy Kennedy? None of the people with him replied. They were as lost as he was. The white man wanted the nigs to save President John Boy Kennedy, Papa Day said firmly. Suddenly, he remembered a detail. Oh, wait. He said and took a swig from his jug of blackberry gin. Uh, okay, got it. Uh, President John F. Kennedy was the name in the year 1963, but the colored people didn't want to save the white boy. Instead, want to send the nigs further back in time before slavery started. Lots of nigs, Papa Day said. They wanted to send them to the year 1510. He paused to look at them with a smug smile on his face. Can you imagine colonials being greeted by 50 or 60 of these black nigs on the beach? Papa Day and Lamont both sighed. Little Bo and Sally sat quietly, still in shock, thinking about the three disintegrated clansmen downstairs. They were dizzy from the moonshine. Papa Day continued. There was an argument with some of the other old white men and some colored people. Papa Day started getting excited as he remembered the details. He talked faster. Yeah, yeah, the colors had to rush. Rush? Little Bo, who had come to be more interested in the story than Sally asked. Yes, rushed, Papa Day replied. They planned to send them to the year 1510, you know, before slavery started. They had to rush and, well... Papa Day took off his hat and scratched his bald head. Mistakes in time were made. What mistakes? Little Bo asked. 
Papa Day looked steadily at the tipsy man that sat in front of him and, as if he was about sharing some classified information, dropped the reply like a bombshell. Three of them. Niggs was transported here instead. Little Bo looked at him with wide eyes. Papa Day took a shot of whiskey and continued. 1883, and now uh, the Niggs are here and don't know what to do. Yeah, they here at Papa Day's farm doing plowing and dumb shit when they should be out there kicking ass. Papa Day don't want to do nothing anymore, half drunk Lamont said. And I am, my head is spinning. Papa Day don't want to do nothing but drink and wait. Suddenly, Lamont's mouth ran more loose. Listen, Papa Day, mahogany... She ain't coming back. You were mean to her. Everybody knows that. And she just had big dreams more than staying on this farm. Hell, she was the only one that ever loved your ass. Betty and Lucille just wanted. Lamont stopped. You don't know. You don't know nothing, said Papa Day. Papa Day stood up and grabbed Lamont, ready to hit him. Suddenly, he stumbled and sat down, pondering on what Lamont just said. Papa Day said softly, Being in bondage all those years make a man hard, turns him, make him different. My granddad used to say, In another land, another place where we were kings and queens, philosophers and astrologists. Papa Day looked down. I'm just a tired old man trying to hold on to the little land I got, he said. Looking at all his scars, he continued, Everyone has a story. She may not return, but God knows the slave masters, they can't take memories. They can make scars. Scars, they heal most times, but they can't take the memories. Remembering mahogany, leaving in that pretty blue dress on that wagon, and that smile, just as fun as she could be, with a tear in her eyes, saying, Goodbye, Big Papa. She was on that wagon cursing as she threw some good moonshine liquor at your ass, Lamont interrupted. And she never called you Big Papa. She called you a uh, fish-eye fool for not leaving with her. Papa Day speaking low. She coming back. Pastor Amos says she coming back. Papa Day didn't care about Lamont's annoying babbles and couldn't hear them either. He had his memories set on mahogany, not wanting to hear any harsher truth about him or his ex-wife or Niggs. Papa Day changed the subject. His stomach growled. He remembered seeing a plate of big turkey bones on Little Bo's hand a little while ago and realized who actually ate his turkey. Did you and Sally practically have to eat the whole turkey? Well, Sally and I were mighty hungry after drinking that cold sweet tea, Little Bo replied. My sweet tea, Papa Day muttered as he threw the last of the turkey bone at him. The bone missed Bo's head as he ducked. Papa Day was just as mad about his turkey dinner being eaten by little Bo and his girlfriend Sally as about them hiding out on his farm. He looked at Mo and felt sorry for accusing his dog wrongly. Good girl, he said as he patted Mo on the head. As night closed in, totally on the earth, fully enveloping it with darkness, Papa Day yelled down the stairs to the basement. You want to go home, do you? Well, get your ass up here. I need you nigs to finish the plowing and fix the fence near the barn first. Old Papa Day returned to his porch, still hoping for his beautiful wife Mahogany to return. No one could sleep because of the heat of the summer night or the drama of the summer day. Lamont grabs his banjo and looks at Papa Day. He strums his banjo. I've been butte and I've been scorned. These eyes no suffering. Of the pain and kind. The year's been hard for the chosen people. But a little talking with the Messiah makes it right. I've been buked and I've been scorned. 
Walk slow and be humble and whisper to the stars, thank you, Lord, be scars no more. Well, there be nigs down there and in heaven above. There be nigs down there and in the heavens above. Lamar turned to Papa Day. You know you can't keep the nigs a secret forever, which sounded more like a remark than a question. I uh, know. Papa Day said sadly, They weren't sent here to fix your roof and plow your damn fields, Lamont said. Ma, no, Papa Day replied again, sadly. Many colored folks out there not doing as well as you could use their protection and help. Papa Day, who had grown weary of Lamont's bits of advice, merely nodded. When you figure in on uh, doing the right thing, Lamont asked, None of your goddamn business. Papa Day retorted, I will do the damn right thing when Lucille tells me so, he said with an air of finality while patting the shotgun that lay next to his rocking chair. When Lucille tells me so, he whispered to himself, looking out in the distance. Later that warm summer night, one small boy, Billy Ray, still hiding, behind a large oak tree saw three large black shadows working in the field. The bright and beautiful moon glittered fully across the dark sky. The small boy turned and ran home, not afraid, but sworn to secrecy. The End